everyone. So I am super excited to share this chat with someone who I now call a friend. And I think this was um, such confirmatory evidence that the resources you need to navigate your experience of personal reclamation always come to you exactly when you need them. Because I had not heard of Dana Martin's work at all, not one time ever, probably as recently as, I don't know, four to five months ago. And then as uh, the, the universe would have it, I heard your name, Dana, three times in one week from personal friends and then from a, a shared friend and colleague, uh, Edith Ubuntu Chen. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm about to interview her because I had begun to ask questions of our little collegial network about other schooling options. Because as we all know, um, those of us interested in personal freedom, bodily sovereignty, and the reclamation path are being asked and invited to integrate, right? So I focus all my energy on emancipating from the medical system. And there are so many other arenas that I have blind spots, you know, whether it's growing my own food or cheaply, you know, in schooling my children. I was very um, enamored with the Waldorf model and found a community that to me will be the gift of this lifetime uh, in that space. But as, you know, the, the, the guillotine started to fall on matters related to health and really perspectives on what health means and what it is and how it interfaces with education. I saw that there was not going to be any way uh, we would be able to continue in that model. And so then what, you know, I have, I am very busy <laughs> and have lots going on. So I always thought that was prohibitive. Um, you know, to homeschooling or anything along those lines. And so your name came up as um, somebody who is not only uh, expert in terms of, you know, uh, teaching, instruction, guidance, uh, speaking, um, but also personally expert, which I hold to be the most validating credential in something called unschooling, which I imagine more people than ever now have heard of as we are unhooking you know, from the system in so many ways. So I'm super excited to just kind of give people a peek into um, your heart-centered brilliance, you know, because the first time I saw a lecture of yours and then I saw an interview, I was sold. In fact, I almost, I told you, I almost like recognized some part of my own soul, you know, that was incompletely actualized in, in you. So I'd love to talk a bit about you know, the, the childhood origins, really, of authoritarian consciousness, because that's a big part of what, you know, uh, folks who are attracted to my work are probably aware of, is that we get programmed early on in ways that ultimately we have to undo and reclaim ourselves from, usually beginning in our late 30s or 40s, probably. And a lot of that has to do with healing you know, healing physically, healing emotionally, working on personal trauma. And then a lot of it, in my case, in the case of many others, has been shadow work, you know, which is finding all those pieces of you that you stuffed in the catacombs because your caregivers didn't approve, you know, and you strategically learned to hide them. And I know that, that what you're onto, the first time, you know, I heard you speak, I thought, well, this is where it begins. You know, this is where it all start and what what an incredible thing to consider you know that we could we could interact with our children in a way that doesn't actually lay the tracks uh for this kind of parentification of public authorities government medicine whatever it might be teachers uh that ultimately keeps us in disempowerment and keeps us dependent and really at odds with our at war with ourselves in some cases um, so you talk about Dana, how a lot of this began for you with birth and that's very resonant, you know, with a lot of what I describe and talk about and write about. And so I, I'd love to kind of start there and, and give you the mic around, you know, how could it possibly start with birth? We're not parenting at birth. So why is it relevant? 
Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Kelly. I just want to add briefly that you were a missing piece in my life too with your work. And so it was crazy to move to Miami and you're the first, one of the first people that I was connected with and it was by Edith. And um, when we met, I, I just felt the same. I felt this soul sisterhood. It was just total ease in your presence. And anytime we've gotten together, we could probably talk for like three days straight, as long as somebody was bringing water in for us and some food once in a while. But yeah, so I, I'm so happy to share about this with your community. So when I gave birth to my son, Devin, uh, so let me start by saying I have four kids. I have two boys and two girls, and they've never been to school, and they've never been punished. So we're going to talk about how that could be that I'm raising people that are kind, compassionate, and caring despite what we've been told we had to do to make good people happen. Um, so when I gave birth to my son, Devin, I gave birth to him in the hospital. My other three were home births, but I gave birth to him in the hospital. I had a natural birth, which was really mind blowing to me because I um, had no idea I was capable of doing that. I wanted to, I knew, knew it was what was best for him. But once I did, and I went through that process, I, I felt like I was transformed and I wanted other women to know about it. And so I went on to study and become a childbirth teacher and doula and later a midwife. But when Devin was born, the nurses handed him to me and I was breastfeeding him for the first time. And one of the nurses came running in the room and turned the TV on. And it was the Columbine shootings happening live. Like he was born right within you know, a couple hours of that. And I remember uh, as I'm holding him, and I'm looking at this, my mind was having a hard time comprehending what was happening. For one, it was recorded live and it was tragic. There were kids jumping out of windows, there were parents crying and they were showing it all to us. It was so crazy. And I remember thinking in that moment that my children will always have the choice whether to attend school or not, because I saw that, you know, I thought to myself when I was seeing these mothers, which was crazy that they were filming it live and showing this for one, it felt awful <laughs> to be seeing these people in such pain. But I thought to myself, how many of these parents and children would have preferred to be together that day? And they didn't know they had an option. They thought they had to do this. They had to put their children in school. And I just decided that my kids would always have free will as to where they would be and where they would learn. And that's where the whole idea came. I swear it was meant to be because I had no idea of my purpose until that moment. And so it wasn't that I didn't want to send my kids to school because I was fearful of them getting shot. It was more about children's rights. I started thinking about it for the first time in that moment. And that's where everything began, began for me. I love it. And I love the, the concept of becoming your child's ally, you know, which I think a lot of us have fears that we've been conditioned uh, to be very vigilant around, which, you know, include a lot of tropes like, you know, you could spoil your kid if you let them have their way all the time, or, you know, who's the boss here? Who's the authority? And of course, that's what we've learned, you know, and, and when you came and, and um, you know, spoke to our community, and I think that this, this concept of um, our woundedness, I'm not really sure how else to put it, but this, this idea we all carry of our woundedness, like where the primary hurt began, that, mm -hmm. that we know that it started then when we began right. to feel shame because of the things we were interested in or not interested in. And you talk about how, you know, this concept of ADD or whatever motive, a motivation is really only relevant when you are com compelling and coercing a child to do something that they don't actually intrinsically want to do. And they don't have an independent motivation around. Uh, yeah. And so what happens when you when your child is, you know, interested or not interested in, in something that's at odds with your preferences is that it gets hidden. And then we become so other focused, you know, and, and we only learn how to strategically survive in service of meeting another's needs. And it's, you know, this authority that we are simultaneously afraid of and also seeking protection from. And then you wonder why we feel hollow and incomplete and don't have any sense of how to navigate through our own, you know, compass. And so I, there's just so many um ways in which we've been conditioned and brainwashed that to wake up to it, it, it induces almost a sense of like grief. That's what me and my 
girlfriend's experience, you know, a lot of us even cried after you spoke. It was this, this feeling of like, wow, it didn't have to be this way. And now look how complicated the, the roots are so deep of this, yeah. of this thinking. But I love, I love this concept of, of nurturing the inner compass and, and how it's not something to be afraid of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. It, it's a, it's a deeply powerful experience when you, when you wake up, you know, on so many levels and people are waking up to so much now. And I think one of the most powerful things that I say to people, which I had no idea really would be, but is to say that, that you were right all along as a child, you were right. You were right that it was unjust. You were right when you were three years old and you felt something was off uh, where you didn't have say and didn't have choice and people weren't listening to you when you were six. And to just say to one another that you were right. It was crazy that you were put um, in, in a position where authority controlled you. And I think most, most parenting advice on the market, uh, you know, given by experts and friends and family even, is based in the authoritarian paradigm dime of, of parenting. And that's the more traditional approach. And there's different variations of that, but it's generally focusing on the needs of the parent for obedience, compliance. And the focus is also on behavior modification, just as the norm. And living in a partnership-based paradigm with my children, to me, like, I feel like I'm a, an alien a lot when it comes to these kind of things, because to me, it just seems like, of course, I'm going to value my kids' needs as much as my own. But as a culture, we really don't. And so letting people know that you don't need to focus on behavior. What you need to focus on is, on is the needs under the behavior. And when you focus on the needs under the behavior, the behavior changes, it's a side effect. So yeah, there, there's so much to it for people to let go of. And we wanna blame somebody. And a lot of times people blame their parents and the authorities in their lives when they were parented that way too. It's like this historical, uh, just this history of abuse, generations and generations and generations. And what I consider abuse is um, controlling another human being and punishing against people's wills. You know, putting kids in timeout to me is just as damaging as spanking on some levels. And so this this paradigm is as strange as it might sound to people. It really is where we're headed in the future. So it wasn't very long ago that men were told to beat their wives if dinner wasn't on the table on time. Like that was in the wedding vows, love, honor, and obey. It was... Um, Just a given. Fathers taught their sons how to control their women, what to do for punishment if their wives didn't obey. And I mean, think how how far we've come since then. And so all that this is really to me is children are next on the human rights agenda. And we will look back on these days uh, as very shameful um, of when children were treated as less than and the focus was on training them almost like dogs. So much of what you see, like with any of the controlling forms of parenting, like I think of the the show, and I've never seen like a whole one the whole way through, but like Nanny 911 and Super Nanny, have you heard of those? Mm -hmm. The whole focus Mm -hmm. is on behavior modification and making a child obey just like a dog. And so to me, this is not like some crazy, like new weird way of parenting. To me, this is what people did way, way before, way before um, they had all this um, authority coming and trying to control them. And so for me, it all starts at birth, that a natural birth starts this entire process of living in partnership with your kids, that when you turn over your birth to, to, for someone else to manage and for someone else to, to handle, um, you're giving away so much more than your birth. You're giving away your entire uh, perspective that you're a good mother. It, I mean, every single thing starts then when it comes to your confidence. And so Having a woman help have a natural birth is, I know, the best thing that I can do that to put her in the direction toward uh, trusting herself. So as well, I, I know who I'm talking to. So I know that I can say anything to you when it comes to conspiracies, because you're like one of my friends that, that gets it. But I believe it intentionally started in hospitals to control, to separate that bond, to break that bond, to make sure that bond never happened between a uh, parent and child between mother and child. So letting a woman know right away, oh, your, your pelvis was too small. The baby didn't fit through. And we have, thank goodness, we were here to save you from that. From that moment, that seed of doubt intentionally is put into that woman saying, you're, you're, you don't know what you're doing. You, you're not, your body couldn't even birth your baby. Never mind knowing how to parent them and never mind knowing how to educate them. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty sad, sad thing. And most people think I'm crazy for saying those things, but I truly know it's truth. I do in my heart. 
I mean, I obviously couldn't agree more. And it's this um, concept that we're also confronting now collectively, which is that when the state, you know, so to speak, owns your body, you're very easily, easily controlled, right? And so then, you know, enter uh, Rockefeller um, engineered educational curriculum that is in service of, you know, generating cogs in the wheel uh, out of every single one of our, our children, then, you know, you have kind of the perfect alchemy. And, and the, the challenge is the Stockholm syndrome, you know, that can be uh, a natural byproduct um, the allegiance that we have. I mean, I am a highly educated person and I could easily feel like all of the um, martyr energy, like oh, all the blood, sweat and tears I put into that. How could I ever throw it under the bus? You know, it's had to be for good. And of course, my children need to, you know, read all the important books and learn advanced calculus. And of course, they need to go to college and uh, you know, the nature of my process has been that slowly, slowly, it's like, I have this image of like these, these bands, like just popping off, you know, slowly, slowly, I'm like loosening this tarp that I was, you know, suffocating under. And this one, it was just, I mean, it was just sudden for me. It was almost learning about your work. And it's like, oh, this is the educational correlate to everything I've ever come to know about bodily sovereignty and personal reclamation and emotional healing. And I mean, we, we, we know what it takes to try to figure out how to connect to your intuition. Why is it so hard as an adult to, to read your own body as a yes or a no instrument, you know, to help you navigate the world? It's so hard because we have literally no experience honoring our own drive. We, we, we literally don't, I, you know, so we don't know what we like. We don't know what we don't like. We don't know what's in our best interest, what's not. We don't know why we're doing things. Our body is not something we have any relationship to other than that it's like a nuisance uh, when, it, when it breaks down. So I, I couldn't agree more that the origins are um, in the birth process. And it's why, you know, as a psychiatrist, one of my greatest advocacies and the one that, you know, brought me a lot of challenges on the public um, scene is home birth for this exact mm -hmm. reasons you're, you're describing, you know, if you medicalize that you're giving, um, not only, you know, the experience to the system, but something far greater, uh, is being imprinted upon you. And, um, that disempowerment can reverberate forever. So yeah. the, I think most of us, I'd love for you to speak to this idea of parent as partner, you know, because I think I know that was something I'm still working on, even though I'm a huge believer in everything that you teach, um, is that I still have this concept that I am a protector for my girls, you know, and I, I experience the world as, uh, you know, dangerous in many ways as nefarious. Um, there's a lot of illusion and how can they know, you know, what's best for them? I, I have to help protect them and, and chiefly their bodies. Um, but the trouble is that if that's how they interact with me, what is the initiatory right that brings them into their own protectorship of self, right? We don't have that culturally. So what happens, I think, and what ha what's happened is that, you know, we were raised by people who had a protector mentality, controller mentality. And in most times, I think you'd agree for, for our own good, you know, um, and then we grow up to be adults and we still imagine the protector is out there and we're either identifying with the protector. So we're idealizing the parentified government who knows best what we need to do, you know, or we are demonizing them in some adolescent dynamic, you know, the way I typically do where, where they're not, you know, doing what I want. And so I'm going to re rebel, but still I'm oriented towards that authority as a parentified entity. So can you trust, you know, your child's um, capacity to navigate <laughs> social media and, and how to spend their time? What if they just play all day, you know? And, and is that a problem? Yeah. These are the kinds of questions that come up for people. Right? Yeah. Well, I love these questions. And the, let me say first, sorry if there's a lot of background noise. I have a, a pug sleeping next to me who snores and then all oh. my kids are here as usual. <laughs> so oh, nice. I, I live, I advocate, do interviews with my all of my, my family here with me. So anybody listening? Experience. That is. So I think this all starts, Kelly, 
when you remember back when you were a child and how the adults in your lives may have interacted with you when you when you're living the authoritarian paradigm you're you're kind of the wall the adult is the wall between the child and their wants and when kids are punished they're fearful of being honest with their parents and a real distrust happens in the authoritarian paradigm because it's focused on obedience and compliance. That's the main goal of, of, of parenting, like training, as our culture wants us to believe. In that dynamic, parents and children don't trust each other. It's just, and that's a huge, really important part of parenting and partnership is you're able to live in connection. And where your children know you're, you're going to help them get what they want in life, and you're not, they're not fearful of being controlled, when you control another person, any human being, whether it's a two-year-old you know, or, or an 80-year-old, the focus stops becoming about what's being controlled and instead becomes about freedom. And so all humans are born wanting freedom. And if you're saying that your child can't have free will and they can't make choices for themselves, they will put themselves in unhealthy situations just to feel free. For example, there's sneak cookies. You know, if you said you can't have these cookies, they, they'll eat the whole bag. They will, they become out of it, out of tune with their internal compass and their balance and their moderation because they want freedom so desperately they overuse or overdo, and that's a really normal reaction to control, actually. However, when you're living in partnership and your children know you're not the wall between them and their desires, and they know that you're their partner and you're going to help them get what they want in life and you'll be by their side, you are influential. When you give them information, they believe you. They don't think it's to control them in that, you know, in the authoritarian dynamic. And so you just have a lot of influence in your children's lives. So, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> when, you're, when your kids want to do something and you're there to support them and say that, I know technology and, and screen time is, is a big concern for a lot of parents. And so say um, that your child, you said you can only have an hour on that screen or whatever, they're going to want to do nothing about that. That's because you're telling them not to. And that's the reaction of that. However, if you have a good trusting relationship and you're living in partnership, giving them information, they're going to take it in and be able to like understand and you can help facilitate them learning more about it. If they have a headache, for example, if my son who's 12 sometimes gets a headache and he turn, I said, well, turns to me for information. I said, well, you've been on for you know quite a while. Do you want to go outside and go for a walk? If you're staring at a screen for hours and hours, it can give you a headache. I mean, it's not the most comfortable thing. And have you had enough water? And and he, he believes me. He's like, yeah, I have been on for a while. Yeah, I'll take a break from it. Let's go outside. So things just flow smoothly. And when you give your kids information, they can make their own judgment call. There was uh, this. This is really interesting. A couple of months ago, my son Orion came out of his room and said, mom, I want to order these blue light glasses. And I said, really? What, what do you mean? And he said, well, I heard that it's really bad for your eyes to be looking at a screen. And so I want to use my allowance to get these blue light glasses. This is a 12 year old boy. I was blown away. You know, I'm so used to my kids doing that, but I was still blown away. I'm like, really? I'm like, you don't have to use your allowance. I'll get them for you. He said, yeah, no, it's okay. I'll do it. But when, when kids are trusted and they're given freedom, they want to do what's best for their bodies. The only time that people don't want to do what's best for their bodies is when they're being controlled and they're in that state of rebellion and they want freedom more than anything else. We, we think back, we all did crazy things. Oh my goodness, I can't even name the amount of times I did things that were bad for me, for me because I was told I, I couldn't do them. So anyway, um, kids make really good choices when they're trusted. You know, all human beings do. And when we assume positive intent instead of negative intent, that's another whole shift. And, and how we view our children. Because I think it stems from you know, religion, for example, but assuming that when somebody's born, you need to train them to be good because they're born a sinner or born bad. That is an entirely different way to interact that with a human being than what I know is truth, is that all humans come into this world good. They're good. They, they want to do what's best for themselves. What human being wouldn't want to, unless it was some reaction to control and fear. So I love what you're saying and, and, and asking, what about if your kids want to do this all day or that all day? And I, I want to remind everybody that your kids want to make good choices that are healthy for themselves. They do. And when you trust them, you can talk and, and navigate and have discussions about pros and cons of certain things. So yeah, it might, it might I, be hard to believe, yeah, but it's true. Yeah. No, I, I, I am a believer. And I think it's only in that dynamic, right, that, that their expressed desires 
are a reflection more and more, perhaps in, in cases where some of us are recovering from a more authoritarian model of their true desires, as opposed to being a response or a reaction, you know? And it's funny because even as we embark on this, you know, probably uh, this adjustment time you've, you've cautioned about, you know, when you go from a system, you know, to emancipating yourself from a system, whether it's financial, educational, um, medical, there is that adjustment and you have to be yes. aware, right, of all of the ways that you're still working with old conditioning. But it's funny because my eldest um, is very, she's just got a lot of, a lot of creative energy, let's say. And she's been studying my awakening process because it began with her birth, her entire life. And she's one of those, you know, who's very observant, extremely observant and calculated. And she can chameleon-like conform to almost any expectations, which makes it so that she's beloved by all. But it's also a, a trait I recognize that has a very deep shadow, right? Uh, where you Definitely. abandon yourself often and Anyway, so she's expressed interest in a very conventional um, homeschooling curriculum that I did not offer, you know, her and that I did. And initially I was like, oh, I'm not paying for your brainwashing. I'm sorry if you're interested in that. You know, I was kind of joking, but um, I kind of uh, withdrew my support. Whereas otherwise, you know, we're kind of, we have a, we have an ally type energy between us otherwise. And we would do things together. I'd help her out and she helps me out with stuff, you know, and I noticed that I withdrew and I just kind of, that's another form of, as I think you'd agree, it's another subtle form of punishment, you know, taking love away, taking attention away. And I, you know, I think the ways that you've inspired me helped me to kind of check myself at a certain point. And just recently I, I said to her, listen, if that's what you want to do, you have my support, you know, let's check it out together. What do you need to register or whatever? And it's painful for me. <laughs> I always knew there would be a comeuppance, you know, like uh, I'd have yeah. a child to become a conventional psychiatrist or something. Uh, but it's, I think we, we all kind of fear that on this path, you know, and then you get to a point where you're like, you're going to love them anyway. I always joke around with the, my 18 year old Tiffany, um, because I'm a midwife and a doula. I always say, you're going to, you're going to schedule your C-section, aren't you? So we have all these inside, you need to form them. And so we, our kids are going to make choices different than us. But when you think back, think back to the times in which, in which the parents your parents and the adults in your lives didn't support you, how, how that felt mm. and how wonderful it felt when you were supported. So I think when we give support, our kids feel so whole, they're able to make really good informed decisions. Right. And if we withdraw that, they're, they're actually drawn more closer to the thing that we might have an issue with. So oh. it's a matter of supporting and then it helps eliminate our fears because we have a lot of fears about about it a lot and, and because we're more awake than the average person I think I, I think uh, our fears sometimes are different than mainstream but they're very real and I think talking about it is really helpful too you know uh, when my kids are interested in something that might be hard for me um, I'll just tell them I'm like really afraid of that what are you drawn to about it and here's what I'm afraid of and we'll talk it through and I swear they give me really great reasons and answers. And I realize it's my issue and not theirs. They're going to take what they want and leave the rest. So when your kids have freedom and they're raised that way, they're not so easily controlled and influenced by anything negative, like in a mainstream curriculum, for example. So they're not going to be so susceptible to being uh, like brainwashed as a child who's conditioned to take orders. You know? so it's amazing. That's any message. You're, such, uh, you're such an early shifter in such a lighthouse, you know, because I think the time that we're in, in this moment, you know, one of my friends, uh, her, she's unschooled um, to varying degrees. She's done it all, Montessori and private school, and they've done everything. Mm -hmm. But anyway, her son is being recruited to Princeton and oh. it like currently, and the yeah. requirements are, you know, frequent, um, uh, COVID testing and social isolation in their room, no friends or other human beings in their dorm room, no eating, no communal eating. So everything is delivery. I mean, it was, it was essentially sounded like some sort of internment camp that you would pay $50,000 a year for. 
And we were talking about how, wow, this broken system is falling on its own. It's falling on its own sword and nothing actually has to be done to dismantle it. You know, it's, it's going to be um, dismantled through its own energies and its own, uh, you know, efforts. And I thought, wow, it's easier than ever to wake up from the illusion, you know, like Alan Watts says, you know, like the, the first grade, the second grade, the third grade, then the high school, college, the job, and then the death. And like, it's like watching a movie in fast forward, you know, yeah without even recognizing that the experience of the beingness was sacrificed, you know, along the way. So we have this opportunity where not only is it somehow making more and more sense to many of us to just opt out of so many things, um, but it may even be that the landscape itself of, of everything that's happening socioculturally supports that in ways, you know, that uh, it, it hasn't maybe ever before in, in human history. So I, yeah, you're yeah, such an incredible resource and I want to make sure that people know, because I am availing myself of your support because, you know, even though I'm a quick study and I can read all the books and, and, you know, feel like I have a handle on it, there's a lot of, I don't want to say hand holding, but there's a lot of kind of reassurance, um, that I, I, I know, you know, is really helpful to those of us who are leaving the system uh, in yeah. the moment. And so you offer a lot of that kind of um, support in addition to your books and of course, you know, public um, offerings on social media. So I'd love, yeah. Uh, yeah, just for you to share with folks who are, whose interest is peaked, you know, like what's the best way to enter into this world? Maybe they've never even heard the word unschooling or maybe they're thinking of just leaving conventional school or, you know, what is the best way for them to support themselves? Because like you said, if, you know, if, 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 if we can recognize when it's our thing, it's our issue, then we're not going to be influencing our children's um, destiny because of our unexamined stuff, right? Or unprocessed, unsupported stuff. Exactly. And we have, um, there, there's so much more to this. As you know, this could be a five hour interview and we'd still not even cover it all. To, to, there's two sides to it. There's the educational freedom and then there's the personal like autonomy and how to live in partnership and do away with the authoritarian paradigm with punishments and control and limits. So there's two parts here to this whole big picture, which makes a one, one part essentially of trusting of children. Yeah, you've talked yes. about it. It's not yes. just about school. Yeah. yeah, right. It's about trusting children um, with you as their facilitator and you as their guide on this path. You're not the one granting wishes and saying you can do this and you can't. You're there to give information and support and and grow yourself. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't grow on my own, just being my children's mother. And um, my kids are 12, 15, uh, 18, and 21, which is crazy. I can't believe I've been doing this for 20 years. I never imagined doing what I'm doing, but I'm so honored to. And so if this speaks to anybody, if you're feeling like you want to know more, uh, most people know what they don't want to do. They don't want to control or limit and punish, potentially. That seems like people know what they don't want to do, but they don't know what to do instead. And that's a really important piece that I want to help people with is what to do instead of the authoritarian paradigm. Because people, when they stop controlling and they stop limiting, things become crazy oftentimes. And, you know, that's when unschooling or peaceful parenting or this paradigm gets called like permissive or neglectful. Because on the path to learning what to do instead, most parents kind of let go of everything. And then it just seems a little chaotic until they know what to replace it with. So this is not unparenting. It's not being hands off. It's not being permissive. It's working in partnership. You know, saying that you're permissive with your child is like saying you're permissive with your husband. Doesn't that sound really weird? I'm so permissive with my husband. It sounds bizarre. They're like, what? It's, it sounds that bizarre to me to say about children. So it's not about permissiveness. It's about um, living in partnership and helping them. So the same way I treat people I love, the same way I talk to you, Kelly, the same way our friendship is, I have that same respect with my children. If I wouldn't say it to you, I wouldn't say it to them. Period. And that is just a whole new, amazingly groundbreaking thing for most people. They're like, wow, I never, I never looked at it like that. And if you listen to the way you talk to your children, if you talk to your best friend or your partner like that, they would not want to be around you anymore. Period. So this is what I want to wake people up to. When you see what you've been doing, 
it'll make more sense. And so joining like a group, a group coaching or this unschooling program that I'm, that I'm offering now or reading books, I have a, a group on Facebook. When you're in a tribal setting and you're hearing how other people handle certain situations, it's really helpful. It was, it was for me early on just to hear how to handle certain situations and what other parents are doing because it just normalizes it. The more you hear about it, the more normal it, it feels. And pretty soon, yeah, you're just, you're just doing it on your own. So yeah, if anybody needs any help from me, I'm happy to help. I do personal one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, the unschooling year-long program. It's like a monthly program. We, get, we talk every week and then every month I do one-on-one -on -one calls and I have a couple books out there. So anytime anybody wants that support, you can look me up. We'll post my contact info in the link below or whatever. <laughs> That's hard. I'm not a morning person, guys. Listen, because I live this life, I'm up really late with my kids. Like 11 a.m. interview to me is like, like 5 a.m. <laughs> We're free. You're doing great, woman. No, no, that's so perfect. And, you know, I, I recently read about, you know, you, you sent us a bunch of us a text on the offering. And I, you know, I scrolled down through all of these elements of support that you offer and got to the sliding scale fee. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, this is like, wow, what, um, you know, I know why you're in it, you know, you're in it because you can't not be. And because yeah. you why have, I'm here, it's why I'm on this earth. Yeah. So and you have like such a patient, patient energy, because I think there, you know, if I were you having gotten this so long ago, all of the sort of things, the neuro it's neuroses, the neurotic things that come up for parents who are, you know, transitioning models and frameworks and orientation. It's, um, it's like their own inner child, you know, expressing. And there's just so much soothing that you have to do that ultimately we have to learn to do on our own until it becomes obvious. I mean, I remember I heard what you said. Uh, I didn't hear you say it, but I heard that sentiment years ago like speak to your child, you know, like the way you would a friend, like, would you say like, can you hurry up and eat? Cause we got to go. No, probably not. Or worse, you know, or yeah. Just you're like threatened to take something away. If you don't hurry up, then you're not going to watch that movie later. Or if you don't hurry up, you're not going to do this. If you said that to any other adult, they'd be like, what do you tell? Excuse me. I That's know. how children feel. And the, the thing is children feel like that, but they are not allowed to express that either to add to the, Children feel that same thing you would feel if somebody said that to you, but they can't show dismay or disapproval. They need to be like respectful. Yeah. Gosh, guys, yeah. like how many times did we feel that way as children? Thousands. And we had to bury it and bury it and bury it. Totally. It's no wonder we're all uh, in our 40s, 30s and 40s and <laughs> doing yoga every day and all this mindful practice. We're trying to get back to the, the default setting that um, was robbed of us as children, right? Because yeah, it's a, learning. Yeah. it's a reclamation of, of reverence, I like to say, you know, even as I focus a lot on self-care rituals, like daily choices that we make and how can we approach, you know, our, our meals or the water we're drinking or whatever with some degree of reverence. But it's also obviously applies to our children, you know, how do we interact with them as Mm -hmm. divine beings that sounds like oh yeah whatever i roll uh but the truth is that we will never feel well whole or in peace or harmony within ourselves if we don't so the incentive certainly is there to begin to decondition oneself around these control-based authoritarian principles habits um and unconscious you know behaviors it's it's got to happen it's the only way i think out of what those of us who are suffering under the, you know, medical tyranny prospects and totalitarian energy, um, it's really the only way out that we do this level of groundwork. Uh, and my, have your support. I mean, I'm, I consider myself so blessed uh, to call you a friend and have called you into my life at just the perfect time. And I, uh, yes, I'll make sure that everybody has your um, information and resources so that, you know, they can interact with you directly and personally. It's so cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer anyone's questions that has any and have a great week. Thanks, Tina. You're welcome.